Hi, everyone. Welcome to our BUAS Intermediate Level Online Workshop at Wizen Academy. And thank you very much for being here today and for taking the time to participate and to learn a little bit more. My name is Laura Perales. I'm the Academy Program Coordinator at WiseLine. And for those who haven't heard about WiseLine and WiseLine Academy before, let me do a very quick uh, introduction. WiseLine is a software development and design services company with operations in the United States, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain with six years of experience and more than 600 employees worldwide. We started as a product company and gradually migrated to the services once we realized that we could help other high growth companies to build better products faster through our different disciplines such as technical writing, project management, user experience, and all engineer disciplines like SRE, QA, artificial intelligence, mobile, etc. WiseLine is a trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Shape Security, and the Washington Post. As part of our learning and development culture, WiseLine motivates all its employees to learn by teaching, which means sharing with the internal and external community the knowledge and experience that we generate day by day contributing to everyone's professional gro uh, growth. And we do this through Wisen Academy and its free educational programs such as workshops, talks, certifications about today's most high value skills in tech in each discipline we have, such as this workshop prepared by one of our engineer experts, Eder Diaz. Thanks Eder in advance for the dedication and for sharing your knowledge, of course. Uh, please um, follow us on academy.wiseline.com or on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, as Wise and Academy, and take advantage of everything that we prepare for you. And uh, so, last but not least, enjoy the course, try to be focused, ask as much as you want about the topic, and do some uh, networking. This space was created for you. So thanks again, and Eder, the mic is all yours. Thank you, Laura. Uh, well, welcome to the VGS Intermediate Workshop. Uh, my name is Eder Diaz. I'm a senior software engineer at WiseLine. I've been working uh, for more than 11 years in web development, and I'm one of the founders of the WiseLine Frontend Chapter, uh, where we basically talk everything about frontend in, in the company. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and by that handle that is on that is below there chrono with a with an H. Um, yeah, uh, well, first some some important notes before we start. Um, try to uh, to identify yourself in Zoom using your name and last name so that we can uh, answer your questions by I mean by by your name uh, also. Uh, well, mute your microphone through the course and be respect, respectful of the rest of the people. Uh, for the questions, use the chat option and type uh, brackets and QQ as a prefix and then put your question so that we can identify identify them faster. Uh, Jonathan Peraza and Charlie will, will be helping me uh, uh, answering most of the questions, uh, but also I'll, I'll be taking some of them, but try to throw as many as you can and, and they will be answering. Um, also, uh, Try to focus your questions on the presented topic. We will have a Q&A session at the end, so don't worry if your uh, question is not related. You can wait uh, till it later. Uh, also, um, if you're having connection issues, turn up your camera. And recording is not allowed. We are recording uh, our so the videos. It will be longer if you don't to record it. Um, also, uh, in our code of con conduct, uh, we uh, we try to be respectful uh, to everyone else's. Try to not criticize uh, questions or ideas. Um, be welcome and also patient. If we 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 can probably start a little bit slow, but uh, well, this is a workshop. We try to make everyone learn. So 
if, if you're super fast typing and we're waiting for the rest of the people, probably you can use your time for asking some more advanced questions, right? And also uh, be careful of the choice of words when, when asking questions or when saying anything in the chat. Okay, without further ado, uh, I'll show you the, the agenda. This is gonna be a pretty heavy loaded workshop and hopefully we will make it in time. Uh, but well, well, we'll be starting with um, the intro, uh, basically what this workshop is and what it isn't. And then we will start with the project setup. We will get our environments up and running so that everyone are on the same page and, and can start working. Uh, after that, we will start with uh, the viewer router. How can we use it to, to basically um, navigate, well, to create the navigation of our page. Uh, then we will see how to fetch data and handling loading states for our application. Um, after that, we'll be seeing Vuex, how to store and share data between components. Uh, after the, that first half, we will be seeing uh, form validation, um, basically try to do a form and, and validate it uh, the view way we should be doing it. And finally, uh, we're gonna uh, just really quick see uh, view test utils to create a, a test for a component. At the end, uh, we will have a Q&A session, like, like uh, as I mentioned before. Um, if there's something we didn't cover, uh, you can basically ask anything around view and well, in its ecosystem. All right, so, well, now that uh, I, I mentioned, we, we were gonna explain what this workshop is, but first, we, uh, what we, this workshop isn't. This is not an intro to view. So probably if you don't, you don't know Vue.js, um, you, you won't enjoy it as if you knew it because I won't be explaining uh, basic topics, right? I'll try to go to uh, to more advanced topics, like if, uh, assuming you know Vue.js already and have used it before. Uh, this is also not an HTML, CSS, or JavaScript course. Uh, so I'm not gonna be explaining uh, well, things like uh, the styles of the components we will, we're gonna be using. Uh, mo most of them are, are already done and set up. So they, I, I, I won't explain that on uh, like too deep. Uh, JS has a, a little asterisk uh, because we will learn some JS tips because Vue works with JavaScript, right? So yeah, we, we will learn JS, but not necessarily it's a JS course. Um, this is not another to-do app, so uh, if you already done those for every language that there exists, don't worry, this is not gonna be that. And also this is not a uh, design system workshop. So if you, th this is not a workshop to learn how to create design systems and probably the components we're gonna be using are not uh, made for a design system. Uh, but what this workshop is, is a workshop to learn Vue.js best practices. If you already know Vue.js, this is gonna step up your game and help you uh, have clean code. Uh, also, uh, this is to learn how to use all of Vue tools um, for, well, all, all of the ecosystem of Vue, which is for routing, for state management and debugging ah, and testing. I, I forgot to add that at the end. Um, it's for people that are tired to do, ma making to-do apps because this is like a more real app and you're gonna see that in, in, in a few minutes. Um, Okay, so the idea is that you are in, in the middle of this. In the left is people that have just read about Vue and probably follow a tutorial. You should be more in the middle. Uh, you, you should have used Vue in the past and probably done a pet project. And after this course, you'll be more on the right where you'll know uh, Vue and its ecosystem and also you'll be able use it to create a, a client solution. All right, so probably some of you might be asking why should you trust that I know Vue.js? And well, the thing is that I'm a close friend of Evan Yu, which is the creator of, of Vue. And that's why he just tells me all of his secrets. And no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the real facts. Uh, uh, we've been working with Vue for more than three years. Uh, also, uh, I've written blog posts about making uh, some components with Vue.js. You can uh, go to this link 
Uh, by the way, we are going to be sharing the, the presentation most likely so that um, if you don't follow, uh, if, so that you don't need to write all of the links I am clicking. And well, you can find them on, on dev to this, this post. Uh, also, I've deployed over 20 sites and apps. Well, not, not just me, but me and my team. And including one of these sites is a, a site with nearly 2 billion visitors in a month. And that's basically a top 10 news site in the United States. And if you don't believe me, that's like mine. Okay, so. Oh, let's get our ID and let's start with the project setup. Uh, you, you should have received an email or at least some uh, some way you, you should have known that you need to, to have node install and NPM. Uh, if you go to your terminal and try node B, you should be seeing uh, the version of, of node. Let's try it here. And it's okay if it's not the same version, uh, but uh, as long as, as the version shows, that's fine. And well, as long as it's not super low, like probably above six is okay. Um, but you'll find out if your version is okay when we install the dependencies. Also something important is the view that tools. Uh, this is really useful when developing with Vue. So if you have it, you can open uh, your, well, you can click here in inspect. It will show your browser console and you should see uh, at a view tab when we are running the project. Uh, probably right now you won't see it, but you should see it uh, in, in your extensions, probably. I'm sorry, I need to track this. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> sorry, I have too many extensions. And also it's recommended, but not necessary, uh, VS Code and these plugins, Bitter and Prettier, because they will help a lot to um, scaffold code and also to make it pretty. And the view CLI, uh, it's also not necessary. We won't be using it, but the project um, I'm gonna be uh, sharing with you was done with view CLI. So just if you want to recreate that, uh, that's a very useful tool. Cool. Um, also, uh, well, be before we start, if, if, you're, if I'm going too fast or or something, please tell, tell in the chat too. Um, so let's start cloning, I'm oh, sorry, cloning the repo. I, I was gonna copy uh, this URL I'm basing on, on the chat so that you can clone this. So basically, you, if, you, if you go to a folder in your terminal and run this command, you should be able to, to clone the project, right? Uh, I have already, uh, clone it so um, I can show you real quick how it should look and it's basically a project with all of these folders and files so I'll wait a, a little bit um, for you to to download that and um, well after doing that we are going to be needing to to run npm install or npm ci uh, I'll start doing that uh, although I already have it installed. So, uh, npm e, hi, I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, it should install all of the dependencies. And when you're done with that, uh, we're gonna be running the server with npm run surf. So, I'm just gonna wait a little bit for, for this to happen. You can also start asking questions if you are already done, if you have everything running. Okay, so I'm gonna run npm run surf just so that you know, you, you can see what um, the, the sites should, should look like. Okay, so if you have everything running, basically uh, your site should look like this. 
Uh, okay, so people is asking which is my theme for my terminal. Uh, I don't really remember, <laughs> sorry. If anyone knows a command to know what's the, the, the theme, uh, I can put it here and, and try to see what, what, it, what is it, but I'm not really sure. I'm using iTerm, but I'm, I don't know what's, what's the, the theme. I think I configured that like probably two years ago, so <laughs> I don't remember. Okay, so also you can probably use the uh, in 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 the Zoom options you can use the yes or no uh, options to tell me if you are already set up, so that we know if we have like the majority of people on board. So are you are you ready? And for example, I just put yes. We have three people. Okay. So how many are we? We are forty-five. I'll wait um, until we at least have like more than half people. And I'll put the instructions here so that you can keep seeing them. Oh, the VS Code extensions were uh, Vtour and Prettier. All right, Rem remember to put yes in, in, in the Zoom controls you have probably on your right side. We, we just have seven people, we need more. Okay, uh, yeah, there, there are some people that probably will have problems with their setup. So uh, yeah, you, we, we can, we, as, as I mentioned, we will be uploading these to, to YouTube. So yeah, you can follow up on this and probably if you have time later uh, and you fixed your, your setup, you can also uh, rerun it with your, with your PC. Uh, but also Char Charlie and Jonathan can help you to troubleshoot whatever is happening. Remember to use QQ between brackets. Oh, by the way, let, let me just uh, check real quick. Is this size of typography okay? Or is this better? Like, okay, I'm gonna put this. Can you answer? If that's okay, or it should be smaller. Okay. Cool. All right. So probably you can start if anyone's still setting up. Um, you'll catch up. <laughs> but yeah, we we. We need to start now because we're 20 minutes past the hour and we need to get our hands on the code. Uh, so first, uh, I'm gonna show you the, the project real quick. That's why I also opened this package, Jason. Uh, the, as I mentioned, this is a Vue CLI project. Uh, you can run you create and the name of your app and it, it will ask you a, a bunch of questions of what you want for, uh, for the project, right? Uh, for starters, um, oh, it installed Vue, of course. And uh, also I, I asked to, to install the Vue router, UX, which we're, we're gonna be learning. And for, for this site, I use Tailwind, which is a CSS library that um, basically I used to quickly do the, the, the site, but uh, this is not gonna be the focus of, of the course, just so, so that you know uh, what I'm using here. Uh, oh, another important uh, thing I installed was Axios for fetching data. We're gonna be using that in, in the third or fourth four chapter of, of, of this workshop. And finally, uh, the view test utils and Jest. 
are, are also installed so that we can uh, test uh, the, the components with, with Jest. Um, I'm gonna do a, a really quick overview of the project and the folders. Um, basically, you will find out, well, this is for the distribution files when we build it. Uh, node modules are what basically NPM install installed. Uh, in public, we have some uh, assets like images for our products and our clients, and also the fab icon and, and the main HTML where the view app will mount, right? The view, uh, if you already view, used view in the past, you know that uh, the HTML is just a div and view mounts in that div, right? Um, okay, so after that, uh, we have the source where, where most of the code we're gonna be using is gonna be and we will be working the most. And test is where we are gonna make our test at the end, right? In source, we have our main JS, which is basically just a view, a simple view app. We're importing view, we're importing uh, our component app.view, and we're creating a view instance and mounting it in the div that I mentioned before. All right. Um, the the app.view just has these three components. Uh, page navigation, home view, and page footer. We can see them in in the page. If, that's why I told you uh, view the tools are going to be really useful. Is if we open them in this tab, you're going to see we have the root of the app, then the app dot view, then the three components I just mentioned. The footer is way, way on the bottom. That's why it wasn't showing, but there it is. Okay. Um, well, in, uh, apart from those two files, we have other folders. Uh, in this assets folder, I have the CSS. I'm using also uh, the, the image of the printer I have here. By the way, it's a 1D printer. It just prints lines. <laughs> and uh, for components, I have already set up some components that we will be working on. Um, we just have one filter that will help us. Well, probably we won't use this, but You'll see that at the end how it looks, uh, but basically just turns a number into a dollar sign number with, uh, well, like a money number. Uh, in pages, we have all the pages we're gonna be working with. Uh, the home page is this one. We have uh, the hero we, where the the printer is showing and the testimonials of the clients, which is here below, but doesn't have anything. We're gonna work on that too. We have the, uh, also a 404 page, thank you page, etc. And well, router and store are two files that are basically just a little bit of code that uh, we uh, that is basically empty, and we're gonna be adding to uh, because well, that's the purpose of this course to know how to use the router, the store, and and well, the rest of the, of the things I mentioned. So hopefully that was enough time for you to catch up and have the project running. And well, we will start with, with the view router. Um, let me just put some things here. Uh, okay. So, well, for the router, we, we just saw that uh, the page has this navigation bar and right now it doesn't do anything, right? If you click it, nothing happens. and we want to uh, click it that the URL changes and also the content changes, right? So let's do that. First, uh, what we need to do is on our main JS, we need to uh, connect the, the, the router, right? I mentioned we have this router file. So what we're gonna do is import it. And after importing it, Sorry, this should be the, yeah. We just use it, well, set it up inside this um, view instance, right? So I'm gonna wait a little bit for you to catch up, but this is pretty simple, right? This is just for you warming up your, your fingers. Uh, import the router and then um, just put the, uh, the router inside the view instance. And well, let, let's check the, the, the index file of, of the router folder. You're, you'll see that we 
have set up some uh, scaffolding code. Um, when, when you do the, the app with the view CLI, this is done. Well, all of this except this. <laughs> Uh, this is something I added because these are the uh, the routes that the client asked us to do. So uh, this, this is the only thing different. And also the routes are empty. I, I put them empty on purpose because the UCLI already adds some of them, but I want you to, to do them um, from scratch. So now uh, let, let's check if we have everything connected correctly. If we imported that correctly, we should be able to click on, on anything here and you'll see that we have the route uh, property in the data. We, it is showing us the path, uh, the query and the params which are empty and the meta. So yeah, everything is empty because we are in the homepage. That's cool. So we know that's working, but that's not really useful, right? Uh, so let's start by, by doing, uh, uh, well, two routes, one for, for the homepage, which we, we already are in and another one for, for the checkout page, which is the, the second one. So to make a route, we just need to put an object inside this array and then put the path, which is the URL path. In this case, we're gonna use the object we have on top and put page.hub. Uh, the second thing that it needs is a name, a name for the route. In this case, well, I'm just gonna call it hump too. And, oh, sorry, this should be pages. And after that, uh, the third parameter, well, uh, a third option you can do add to this object is the component. And, well, this is needed because uh, that's the component we want to render in this page, right? So I'm, I'm gonna write home here, but we don't have the home component imported, right? We're gonna do that here. Remember that we had these pages uh, folder. Here you, you'll see we have a, dot, a home dot view. So we can basically just import home from um, pages um, dot view, right? So that's the first route. Um, but well, that's not really useful because that's the same we have, just a home page. So I'm gonna just copy this, paste it, and do the same for the checkout page. I'm gonna wait at, at the end of this because I'm probably going a little bit fast, but you can tell me in the chat if I'm going too slow or too fast. So I'll do the same, check out. And from this, I also copy paste it. Just change the checkout. Right, so yeah, before I change file, I want you to, I want to know if, if you already got this, it's basically just two, two routes, path, name, component, and that's it, right? Cool. Uh, well, uh, now I'm, uh, I cannot test this yet because, well, our navigation doesn't work, right? So we need to link to, to these pages somehow. Um, we can go to the components. Inside of that folder, we have the page navigation. And here, we'll find out that we have three uh, links. But well, we just we just have two, two routes, the, the home page and the checkout one. So let's link them to, to those routes. Uh, what the view router needs to link to those pages is not an anchor. Like I know HTML works with a tags, but in this case, we need to, to use something called a router link. And works basically the same as, as an anchor, but instead of href, you put a two property. So in this case, if we want to go to the home page, we put here the path of that home page, right? The same for checkout. We do router link to checkout. Cool. So I'm just gonna wait a little bit just to see, to, just for you to catch up.
Uh, sure, yeah, I can show you the main JS again, just in case uh, you didn't put the router in there. I'm just importing it and putting it in, inside the view instance. Okay, so we already uh, installed the view router. We added some routes and we added uh, the router links, right? So let's see if that works. Here we have the, uh, the navigation. So we click home, well, nothing happens. We click checkout. It seems that nothing happened, but look at, at here at top, we have this checkout uh, URL, well, path added. So it means that it is working, at least it's changing the, the URL, right? But we are missing the content. The, the content should not be the same. We're, we wanted the checkout page to be showing here, right? So let's get back now to our app.view. And well, that is happening because we have this home view component hard coded. Like there's no way the router know, uh, to, there, we, we don't have a way to let the router know where should it inject the view, right? So for that, we will use the router view. And we can get rid of, of the home view because we don't need it anymore. So yeah, just replace it the, the home view that was hard coded and now the router view. This will basically uh, tell the router, hey, here you can inject the, the component that was initialized in, in the router file, right? So now let's get back to, to the page, test it. And we can see it's changing. And also if we look at, at, the, at the tree, we can see here we have the home page, but there's something added at the right that is telling us that this is a router view. So when we change the route, it changes for the checkout component and it's telling you uh, this is a router view uh, when it is slash checkout, when, when the path is slash checkout. And also if you look at, at the route, it changes, right? We have a path that says slash checkout. We have the name of the route, the full path, all of that changed, right? This is before I'm going to check out in the homepage, everything is just a slash. All right, cool. So let's see if everyone's uh, on board on this. Um, I'm just gonna put this screen a little bit so that you can uh, catch up and put the router view if you didn't. Um, I'm not uh, reading anything in the chat telling me like, should go faster, so I'll assume that I'm, I'm in a good pace. Okay, so, well, now if, if you already have this running, let's go to an exercise. If we go back to uh, to the router dot in, I mean the router index, uh, you'll see that we have other pages, right? So let's try to do the, the products one. I'm gonna give you uh, probably, um, five minutes uh, for you to add the products uh, route. And also remember that you need to go to the page navigation and change this link. And uh, well, also the, the, the route should have the component. And remember our, our page components are in this page folder and we have a products one. All right, so uh, probably 439, I'll start asking if everyone's done. Meanwhile, I'll start, uh, I mean, for, for the people that are, are not uh, following them themselves, I, I'll start doing it so that um, if, if you don't want to, um, to do it by yourself, you, you can just follow me. And okay, probably, Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, this question is going to be answered by Charlie or Jonathan. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to leave them do that. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll, I'll be adding the, the next route. So I'm just going to do it quietly for the people that are doing it.
Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be answering that. Is it a good, a good practice to split script style and template sections in multiple files and just import all together? Uh, well, I, in, in my own opinion, uh, it's better to have them like in one place, right? Uh, the only case I will think of doing that, like splitting them is just if the component is super big, but in that case, I will say that just extract like certain functionality or make more components so that that big component becomes smaller, right? Um, not sure if that, that answer your question. Okay, cool. Yeah, because that's that's the main advantage of you files, the, the single file component file, uh, single file component, sorry, uh, that you have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and everything is bound together, right? Like uh, you you can check the, the functionality for all that. Um, remember to use the QQ in brackets. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna read that, that uh, question, but it's easier for, for uh, uh, the mentors to read them. So the use with Peter for listing your Vue.js code, what, what do you mean by listing? Ah, oh, linting. Oh, okay. Now uh, that's also uh, in the setup of the project. We have ESLint. We have some rules here. And yeah, it, it also extends from a Vue Essential uh, plugin that already has some Vue rules like you're gonna see them later, uh, but basically some rules like hey, your component should not have this and that, or, uh, or and the rest of the rules are extension of Airbnb, uh, which basically is like the uh, trailing uh, commas and semicolon. And well, also I just, I added some for not using console and stuff like that. But yeah, th this is also done by the Vue CLI. That's a cool thing. Uh, and I believe also for Prettier, yeah, I have some things here set up. Um, just because I want Prettier to put the single quotes, trailing commas, and parentheses in, in the arrow functions. All right, so it's time. Uh, how many of you were able to do the, the exercise? Basically, what we needed to do was just add this path you can see we're using the pages that products we have here on top and the component products was imported like this. And in our page navigation, we just needed to add the router link to products. And you should be seeing a page like this, right? Cool. So what's next? Um, what, what if we want to do a 404 page, right? We have this error page but for example if we just copy this do for error page we put here error and we also import the error page by doing something like this sorry if I went up a little bit too fast but I'm sure you you're already used to make paths and routes so, oh wait, the, the page is not error. The page is called 404 here. <laughs> and probably I'm gonna call it page 404. So the thing about this is that I just made a route uh, for slash 404. And if I go to that uh, page like this, I will get the 404. But if I write something else, I don't get anything. Basically, the router will say like, hey, this is a pad, but I don't have any component to render, right? So it will just render the, the page navigation and the footer. And the router view is just empty. Uh, so for that, we just need to use something like this, which is a wildcard. And well, we put this at the bottom. Uh, because if you put it on the top, basically we will do that everything goes to the 404 page. What it does is that it will go uh, route by route and if it doesn't match any of these, well, it will fall into this route 
and we will have the 404 page, right? I put the code here just so that you see that it's just the path with an asterisk, so that's it. And well, that, that's for error pages. Now, I want to show you uh, a super pro tip optimis in optimization. So let's build this, this project. You can use your terminal or the one in VS Code to, to build the project. And what I want you to show you is how this looks uh, when it's built, right? Because we, we have like a bunch of files here. We have uh, component files, we have router file and the main JS and all of that. But when you build it, you will basically basically convert all of that into JS and CSS files, right? Uh, so after this is done, um, you will see uh, the that everything is just one JS file. Okay, here we have, well, not one JS file, it's two JS files with their mappings. Uh, but basically it's, this is the dependencies and the app that, well, the app one is the whole app, like our components and everything else, right? Uh, so the interesting he thing here is that if we see this in, in, in our browser, uh, for some reason my PC is a bit slow, but I wanted to show you uh, what are what's the size of, of this file? Oh well, anyways, it shows here. So you can see we have a, a 12.6 uh, kilobytes file right in our app. But the thing is that we have a bunch of routes, right? Like uh, we have four routes, and probably the the users are just gonna be seeing the home page at the beginning, and they're loading everything, right? So there's a trick for that. I'm going to paste this code because this is uh, a, a little bit uh, long. I'm going to put it in the chat, don't worry. But basically, if you just put this instead of the regular thing we did, uh, it will tell Webpack to split this into another file so that you can load it separately. And uh, basically, the when, when the user, user first loads the page, it will load the home one and well the app one and and then the other ones will be in different files for uh, the page to load separately and, and not load like everything at the same time and well this uh this part here puts uh it, it seems like a comment but in reality it's telling webpack to uh oh sorry you got an error oh yeah since i am I'm dynamically importing checkout. We don't need this import. We we are dynamically importing it here, so that's why it failed. But oh yeah, I was mentioning this part seems like a comment, but actually tells Webpack to name the the file as checkout so that we can identify them easier. But you can also just remove this, and Webpack will call it like a hash uh, name or something. Okay, I'm gonna read uh, questions while, while if there's, no, I'm seeing that uh, Charlie and, and Jonathan are take, taking care of that, so that's cool. Okay, so now we go to the dist. We have, you, you'll see that we have this checkout, yeah, yes. And you can see that the app was reduced by some kilobytes. And well, some of them were added to, to the checkout one. It seems that it duplicated in size, but probably it's because the, uh, well, uh, there, there are some base code that you need to have, but it's, it's still pretty small, right? Like if, if you had more components, this will be larger and that's when this pays off, right? When, when you can start taking out things from, from the main file. All right. So now that uh, we're, we're basically done with routing, we probably are gonna be do, doing more routes, but just for, for recap and before going to the next part, remember that routes need a path, a name, and a component. Uh, you can use the router view to, to load the corresponding component into the page. And when you import them like this, uh, you'll be benefiting from code splitting. Also, you can use the router link to, um, to go to, to the pages, well, to, for navigation instead of the anchor tags. 
and use the wildcard to catch all of the routes and make them 404. All right, next topic, fetching data. Uh, probably you, you, you saw the, at the bottom of the homepage that we have this. If we go to the view dev tools and, and see that the, uh, this component, this whole component is the client's testimonials. We have a, a loading animation here and we have the uh, a testimonial also. So um, you, you, we don't have any data, right? And we need to show some, some data here. So let's go to this component, the client's te testimonial so that I can show you uh, how it is looking right now. Uh, here it is. I'm gonna close the rest of the tabs and uh, well, luckily we, we have here uh, an endpoint that will give us some, some uh, JSON data. We can see it here. And you can see we have an array with seven uh, clients and their pictures and also a, a description, right? So we, we are gonna be showing those inside this, all of, well, the, uh, inside this component, the single testimonial. All right, so the first thing to do is to, uh, well, when, when should we fetch the data, right? And I'm gonna throw these questions to, to the chat. When, when do you think we should chat, we should uh, fetch the data of this component? No one? Oh, okay, well, um, meanwhile, I just, I just saw that there is a question. Can you show the component error in index for router? Uh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so, sorry, the router. Yeah, my PC is dying. So the, the component is a page 404. This one is not uh, error because I don't, I don't know. I don't know why, why didn't I call it like that, but it's 404 so for some reason. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm seeing answers right now. So yeah, some people are saying when the component is created, some people are saying when it is mounted. Um, so yeah, probably um, both are not wrong, but I do prefer to do it after it is mounted. Uh, when it is created, uh, sometimes you don't have access to parts of the browser. So it's a better practice in general to, to just do it in, in the mounted hook. Uh, so let me show you how, how does that look. Sorry for some reason. What? Yeah, I, I was trying to type something in the chat, but for some reason it's getting me back to the, uh, to the editor. Anyways, mounted. Yeah, this is the mounted hook. Uh, this executes whenever uh, the component is already mounted. And the cool thing about this is that uh, well, we can use axis here. And if you're used to a sync and await, we can use that syntax here. Basically say like uh, async and then await axios. Oh, first we need to import axios. And then tell it to get the URL we have here. And we will set that up into a response variable, right? So now we have that response. Where should we set that up? Uh, probably we need some internal data to, to do that, right? So we can put a data here that returns our clients and The clients by default will be just an array, empty, like in case uh, the this fails, it will still be an, an empty array. And, oh, a good question. By default, mounted is already asynchronous. Uh, no, if you, if you don't put this, it's not asynchronous. And actually, when I do this mounted, I'm not telling it uh, to mount after the, the this response is done. Actually, the, the component will mount and it will render 
and after that it will run this method right and we're going to see that because we want the loader to show first and then the the response so now that we have the response we can just uh, tell that our clients equal to uh, the response dot data and well let's see if it, that worked and well before going to the browser i'm gonna let you write that down and if that worked, we can click this client testimonial and we'll see that we have our clients array full with the seven people from from the json right that's cool so well another good practice is what if this fails right we uh, probably whipping this url the user doesn't have internet or something and it will fail so uh, we can basically do a catch and uh, take the error and a good practice is always log the error so that you can check on your server what was the error. So I'm just gonna do that. And also uh, to know that this uh, is, sh well, that, that this still re uh, returning something to the response, right? So we will just return an object with data that is empty so that this doesn't break anything. If, if we set response to null, uh, we might have problems, right? So we we better have the response with the data as empty so that clients are still empty and we don't get any errors. Um, after that, well, we, we, we are fetching this, but we're not showing anything yet, right? So let's fill that data inside our client testimonial. As you can see, we have name, picture, description, we, which is the same thing as, as in our clients method. So we just use a V4 here. Sorry. So V4 client in clients as a key is a good practice to use the, the ID of the client or whatever you're using that has uh, that is unique. Uh, if you, it's not a good practice to use uh, index, but some people do it. Uh, but if you have uh, and an index that's, I mean, uh, a unique ID, that's even better. And for name, well, we will put the claim.name, picture the same. And description will be the same. Oh yeah, the URL is in, in the code. You can look for, for it inside your file. Okay, so I, I'm just doing a V4 here and everything inside this client, all is taken from all the clients, each one, and the properties are set up into this single testimonial file. And if that work, we should see all of our client testimonials here. There they are, there are seven, so they're showing, that's cool. But we still have our loader in the top, right? Uh, it's not going away. <laughs> so what can we do? Uh, as I mentioned, the, the mounted method will run after the, the, the component is mounted. So this will render even before fetching data. Uh, so we want to make the loading animation disappear after it has been loading, right? So we will create a new loading data here that is by default true. And in our mounted method, after we set the, the, the response data, we will say this dot loading false. I'm sorry, equals false. Right, so we're telling it that uh, our loading, well, we, we finished loading and it should stop showing the loader. So here we just need to do an AP if 
to stop rendering it. I mean, to render it only when it is loading, right? So if it is not loading, it will disappear. Cool, so hopefully you, you got to this part. And now if you go to your site and refresh it, you briefly see the loader and then the testimonials, right? So that's working. And the final thing, we're, I'm gonna provoke an error here. I'm gonna just put like a fake URL to see what happens, right? So doesn't seem bad, right? Like, uh, yeah, we see the loader, then it disappears. But the thing is that our component says client testimonials, uh, we don't have any. So probably if we have an error, we don't want to show anything, right? So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna create another data property that is called error, but it's the false. And before returning here in the catch, I'm gonna say error equals true. Sorry, this dot error equals true. And similar uh, to the way we did, we did it with the loading, we're gonna hide all of this with a b if error. And I'm gonna get back to, to this part so you can see it. All right, so, I'm oh, sorry, it should be the opposite. <laughs> if we don't have errors, we show the, the component. So be if not error, right? So that's it. It is loading, it gets error, so it just removes the component. Probably you can do something else like faking some testimonials or something, but yeah, just uh, just wanted to show you this, like this is a good practice to handle errors when fetching data, right? All right, so now uh, let me remove the the error from the URL so that we get, get back to getting our testimonials. Um, for some reason, we're getting like a bunch of testimonials and we just want to print uh, the first four, right? Uh, so what, what will you do? Like the, the API gives us seven, but we just want the first four. Any suggestions? Splice array. Okay, so yeah, that's an option. You, you can splice it here before setting into the, the client's uh, data. But uh, well, that's actually a good option if you want. What, what I like to do is something different. Like, uh, well, actually first I'm gonna show you like the bad practice, right? Some people like to do this. After the before, they just say eh, B, B if, and well, they also, don't follow me on this by the way. <laughs> they just put an index here. So if the index is less than four, it, they, they will render that, right? But actually some of the linting rules we have will prevent us from doing this. If we try to, to go here, it says, A, you should not use B4 within an, with any B, right? That's like a bad practice. Uh, why? Because you're forcing, whenever this gets re rendered, you're forcing it to check for, for this evaluation. And, and it's pretty simple, right? You're, you're just checking uh, if it less if, if it is less than four, but I've seen some people even put methods here, so it can get really uh, complicated for for and also if you have a, a lot of components, it will uh, make the site slow, right? So if you don't want to do this, and well, the splice option is is a good one, but I'm gonna put a third option, which is have a computed property. And well, if you know, if you don't know about 
uh, computer properties, uh, basically they're just like uh, variables that depend on, on your data, right? So for example, we can call this uh, first for clients and we will return clients but filtered by uh, the, the the same uh, evaluation we did in the before, right? So we have a client and an ID, and we just want the the IDs that are less than four. I'm sorry, this this is not ID. This is index. <laughs> so why is this better than the D if in, in we did before? Uh, basically because we, whenever we set this clients array, this will automatically evaluate and, rend and render uh, the, the component on top, right? When we were doing the beef, we'll try to, to do this evaluation for, for each time it renders. And this way it will just uh, render again if the clients change. Uh, oh, good question. Computed will be called first or mounted? Uh, actually, computed is called first. So, for example, the, well, computed is called whenever something in the data changes. So, at the beginning, clients is empty, so it will be called, but since it is empty, the filter will also return empty. Then the mounted will execute, will change the clients, and this will execute again. Right, so th this is basically like another data. You can treat it like that, like just another uh, property in your data that will change as you change the, the other properties. So now if we did that correctly, uh, oh, it seems that is not working, but let's check. If we go to the VDEP tools and check the client testimonials, we can see that we have our seven clients and this is the cool thing about using computers. Uh, basically, you can check that we have the four clients, so this is working fine. What is not working fine is that we're not using this in the template, right? So we need to go to the B4, and instead of clients, we're gonna be using the first four clients. And that will render just those clients. Okay, so uh, hopefully you got this right um, because now you're gonna do it by yourself. We have the same thing in our products page. If you go to, to products, you can see we have the basically the same thing. We have a URL here. We have a product widget uh, that is hard coded with one value. And when you load this, it, it, you will get an array of uh, products that we need to render with this uh, in, in this product widget. And also you have a loading animation. So it's basically the same. We, you, you can go to uh, here to products and this is the page. So we need to render a bunch of these products. I'm gonna give you probably 10 minutes also for people that are probably would like to take a break, uh, get some water, but well, at 5.15, um, I'm gonna check uh, if you are done with this part of exercise and continue. Also, uh, I'll be answering questions. Uh, so if you're not following the exercise, feel free to, to start asking questions. For people that want an extra challenge, uh, you'll notice that there is a property here called right side picture uh, that basically if you put it to true, the picture will be on the right. If it is false, it will be on the left. So if you finish with that, try doing that every product shows in a different side, like the first one on the left, the second one on the right, the third one on the left and so on. Okay, I'm seeing some answers to do the, the right side thing. And yeah, that, uh, getting the module of, of the product ID, well, probably I wouldn't take the product ID in these cases. Uh, the product IDs are one, two, three, four, five, but probably the, 
uh, when, when you are working with a real database, the IDs won't be that way, right? You can have like one, five, seven, or something like that. If, okay, yeah, if you meant the index, that's another option, but that will be similar to having, um, well, no, that, that's actually fine. And I'm just gonna show you um, another way we can do it also with computer properties. But we're gonna give other three minutes for people to, um, to, to finish. Or you can put yes if you are already done to see how many of you want to continue. I mean, in, well, in the chat is okay, but it's better in, in the buttons you have so that I can count them. By the way, if you handle the, the error, that's fine. I just didn't do it uh, because I'm lazy and well, I already did it in the last part, but well, you can copy paste the uh, the way we catch the, the error. So just to show you another way to do that right side thing uh, for the people that are already salted with the index module mo modulo two, you can also call a method here that it's called probably uh, something like is auth because we want uh, the odds on one side and we send the index. And we can have this method here. This is just another way of doing it. If you already do, did it with um, the way it shows in, in the chat, that's fine. So yeah, that's another way, right? Like calling a method and that's the same as put it in line. But I have another way to do this. And well, we are in time. So if you solved it, that's cool. Uh, if not, we're gonna continue. Uh, instead of calling a method inside a V4, we can also do a, a computed property. Uh, and why is this good? Well, because the same reason uh, of the client's testimonials example. Basically we're evaluating here for every product this method. So whenever something changes, everything will reevaluate. And this is not that bad. Like calling a method is not that bad. Uh, the, the, the downside of this is that uh, if you go to, to this project product uh, component, you'll see here the products, but you don't know why they're uh, rendering one side on the other until you click one of them. And you see like, oh, okay, this, this has the right side picture set to one and this one to zero, right? So uh, a, a better way is to do a computed property. And I show you how we also do a computed here. And we're gonna call these uh, products with alignment. And we're gonna return these dot products dot map. We're gonna iterate over each product and also get the index. And for each product, we're gonna return, this is ES5 with the structuring. We're gonna return the same product, but with an extra property that is called uh, alignment. Sorry. And well, this can be the method we created 
அந்த பாட்டு I'm just gonna put it in, in a method. I mean, in a constant here, just because it's easier to read. And actually, I, I want to change the ESOT to put true or false. So I'm just gonna check if this is zero. And yeah, th this seems a little convoluted if you're not used to functional programming, but you can do this also with a regular four. Uh, but what we are doing is that we, uh, we check for each product and their indexes, uh, what will be the alignment and we create a, a computed property, basically, well, a, a new product with this new alignment property. So that will be set here. And we can use this instead of the regular products. And here we can just say product dot alignment. And we can get rid of the index here. So the advantage of this is just that uh, we don't have any logic in our template, right? But also, uh, well, if you use the method in, in the template, that's also like not having a lot of logic because you're just calling a method. But uh, the real advantage is that if you go to your page and for some reason it is not showing, okay, you can see the products page and you can see that you have your regular products and then you have the products with alignment. And you can see here that they have their alignment set to true or false, depending if they're odd or not. Oh, so a question. Uh, do we always have to define a function in methods if we want to use it in computed? No, actually that's a really good question. We can basically if, if the method is not using anything from the state or the properties of the object, you can extract it like constant is odd equals this function, right? And you can make it probably an arrow function. And remove it from, from methods. And instead of using this dot is odd, you just use the function you declare here. Uh, oh, and yeah, th this can be, well, it, the linter is telling me that I can just return this. And yeah, I need to define it on top. <laughs> but just wanted to keep it on, on the bottom so that you could see that I just extracted the same function. But yeah, you can do, do this if, if your method doesn't need to know anything about the component. You can definitely do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you mentioned. Uh, yeah, we just use it if we want to access the state or props. Cool. So now that we are done with our products, uh, what about, uh, well, going to the actual product, right? We are not, uh, for some reason it got us to the home page. And if we remember the router thing, uh, probably that's because we don't have a router link. So let's get back to um, to our project and we can go to the product widget, which is uh, the one we're using there. And let's check for uh, the show details button, which is this one. And we have an anchor. So we need just to change that to router to, and then go to product ID, right? The cool thing is that we have already this product ID thing, but uh, let's see if you're still awake. What, what will we need to, to make this work? Okay, you're not awake. <laughs> Don't worry, well, to make it work, because if we right now just click it, um, well, for some reason it's not working. Ah, oh, sorry, it's router link. <laughs> I don't know why I just put router there. 
Okay, so we have a 404. So that's because we don't have the route. Uh, this is another, like I, I could get back, I, I mean, this I could explain this in, in the router section, but uh, we, don't, we didn't have a way to do it. So uh, now we have a good example when we have products here, uh, where there can be like many products and it's not just one route, right? And uh, I don't think it should, you, you should be like declaring one route per product, like product number one, product number two, and so on. So the way you do that in, in uh, here in the router is that you take this single product here that we have here. And we're gonna do some string interpolation just to concatenate some text. Basically, we're gonna say like, okay, when single product has slash and then something, that something will be our ID, right? And we're gonna call this product and we need to put here the single product. Okay. Oh, that'd be, sorry. And well, getting back to this so you can see it. Uh, how does this work? Um, basically, when we put this semicolon, we're telling uh, the view router that this could have like anything. And that anything should be set into this ID. This could be any uh, any name you want. I put ID because it's the, mo the thing that made more sense, but you can probably use product or something like that. But yeah, ID makes more sense because that's the thing we're using here. And if we go to to our view dev tools, check the route, you'll see that we have the full path product one. It, it used the product uh, route and when we collapse these params, here we have the ID, right? So that's cool because we want to use that. Uh, but well, be before going, uh, before using that that param, uh, we need to do something else. Uh, here we have the the product, and you can see we have just a printer. And but actually, this could be like any other of the other products, right? Like if we get back to the products page, you click here in a toner, we should see that toner, right? Right now we don't have a, an endpoint to get a single product, so we should use the same uh, the, the, the same data we already have. So I will tell you, okay, let's inside the the single product page, probably we can fetch the data of all the products and just look for for uh, the one that we have in their URL and and set it here, right? Uh, but the thing is that we don't want to do that because we already are fetching the data before. And sorry, and we want just to reduce this data, right? So to do that, we need to do, to go to the next step, which is using Vuex. Uh, but well, before getting to Vuex, um, I'm just gonna give you a quick recap of what we did. We use async await for promises to set our loading state. We also use try catch, well, uh, catch in, in the promise. Uh, for fetching data and, and use and set errors. Also, uh, we don't use the ifs inside before because that's a bad practice. And instead, we use the computed props to make uh, to change the presentation of the data and the props. And a pad with semicolon and the variable name will put the variable inside this route params uh, object. Um, okay, so. If all of this is clear now, um, we, we can go to, to the next part, which is Vuex. Anyone in the chat knows what Vuex is? Or how many of you have, have you used uh, Vuex? You can uh, click no or yes in, 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 in the buttons of, of the Zoom. Okay, state management for view. Yeah, manages the state of the app. 
well, the state of the app, not necessarily because, well, every component has a state. And actually the main state is in our main.js file. So we're not setting a state here, but we could, right? And every component is like a, a, another part of, of the main state. So Vuex is, uh, is not the, the state of the app. It is more like a tool to uh, handle the state management uh, between, uh, uh, between components. And yeah, well, the, the main usage we're gonna be doing is, for example, here we, we have this page, you go to the single page, there's some data that should be passed, but it's difficult because these two components don't, don't know each other. And also you can see we have a checkout button here with a number. And if we add the cart to, to the cart, uh, the product, this should change, right? And also these two components don't know each other. That's when we use view, when we want to communicate components that are really uh, far away. If they were just like a parent and a child or something like that, that would be easier. But in this case, they're separate components. And well, let me get back to the presentation just to show you something really quick. Uh, we've been using view components right now, and they have their own uh, data properties and well, computed and methods. So imagine that Vuex is like a big uh, view component. Well, not not view component, but a big uh, state or global state that we have for for all of the components, where they will communicate in this way. They will dispatch an action then this action will be able to, um, to get any data from that component and also from any API or whatever you want to connect with. After that, the data will, will be committed to change the state with a mutation. And we, in the DevTools, we can see those mutations. We're gonna see later how that works. And that mutation will change the state. The state will, um, will basically uh, be updated and tell all of the view components that have a reference to that part of the state to render again with that new value. So if, if you've just view, this seems like basically like data, right? Like when, when you change data, uh, it will re-render the component. So this is similar. This is like a, a, a shared data outside of your component, but that you can reference in your component. And well, Oh, that's a good joke. <laughs> you can give your cell phone to communicate your children with your grandparents. Yeah, <laughs> this will be the, the cell phone basically. Um, cool, so how do we start adding Vuex? Uh, well, we, we will start similar to the router. Uh, we have this index file, which is basically a, v, a Vuex empty store. And here in our main.js, we're gonna import it. Just like this. And the same as the view router, you just put the store in there. And this is the cool thing about uh, the view ecosystem. Since all of the tools are custom made for view, they're super simple to, to install and set up, right? Probably if you've used React or jQuery or other things that have like a lot of uh, third party tools, they're sometimes more difficult to set up than this. So now that we have that, well, first let, let's see if, uh, if that works. I'm gonna get back to this so that you can see import store, put the store in here. And in my, well, we, we don't have anything in the state. So we want to have the products, right? So if we get back to, to the store index, I'm just gonna do like if this was data. So I'm gonna set up my products as an empty array. Oh, sorry, products with S. And if this works, then we should be able to see, well, it will refresh because it says like, hey, there's new state or something. So I need to refresh. And if everything is set up, you can click here in the load state button and you will see that we have products and they're empty because we set it up like that. So that means your Vuex is working. I'm gonna wait a little bit until you get here. Like 
uh, if uh, some, someone has a problem, please put it in the chat. But if you're here, then click yes, so that I can continue. All good, okay, cool. Yeah, it seems like the, the majority has it working. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Hopefully, that, that's good that you, you, don't, you didn't get lost. Um, so yeah, we have our products here. Um, similar to what uh, we did in our component, uh, we need to, when, whenever we, we go to this page, we, we need to fetch the products. Also in, in the single product page, we need to do it here. So we will do like a mounted and fetch the data, then update the data and render it, right? Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna uh, take the products page because that's already done and take this, uh, basically th this part of the, uh, of fetching data and put it inside an action. So we are gonna call the action fetch products Uh, also, this needs to be an async function because it's going to fetch that data. And well, the difference here is that we, we saw in the diagram, we should not be setting the products directly, right? So I'm going to comment this. Oh, and I need to import access. And well, we have the response, but what we want to do to set up the products is to uh, commit my changes into a mutation. So how do we do that? We we'd receive here a context object that will help us to commit the changes. And well, probably we can call this, we, we need a, an identifier. So this is gonna be set products and we're gonna send the response that data. The important thing here is that your mutation should have the same name that we put here. So I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna call my mutation set products. And we, we saw in the diagram that the mutations will set the, the state, right? They are the ones that change the state. So that's why uh, they also receive the state. That's a cool thing. And they will receive the, the products we sent in the com in the commit function as a second parameter. So here we can say state dot products equals products. And we can now get rid of this. Pretty simple, right? Ba basically just we just uh, the, the two lines that we put here, we just have to expand it a little bit. And you might say, why not just setting, uh, sending a, a commit from my component? Uh, that's because uh, you might need to do more things in your actions. It's a good practice to just separate actions from mutations and not let your components just mutate freely the, uh, the state. So now if we have this, we just need to connect it to the component. And how do we do that? Well, uh, since we, we, we already are doing this in, in, in the action, we just remove this. Also, we can remove axis. And we need to somehow get that action, right? So for that, we will import an utility from axis that is called, I mean, from UX that is called map actions. And what this does is that uh, it will help us to make an action, a method in the component. So we can create again our methods here. And the way we use the map actions is by using three dots to the structure, the map actions. And inside an object, well, inside parentheses, and then an object, we call the method we, I mean, the, the, the way we're gonna call the action inside our component, oh, sorry, it was fetch products. 
and the way it was called in, in Vuex, which is also fetch products. You can name them differently in case you probably, if, if you already had like a method that is called this way, you can change the name. So uh, that names on, on the store don't collide with your own method names, right? And here in the mounted, we had the await. And the difference is that we're, we are not gonna do the, um, the access call, we're just gonna fetch products. And you can see I'm not assigning anything to, to, to this, right? Because, well, if, if we get to, to our actions, uh, we're not returning anything here, we're just changing the state. And that's a good practice. We should not return anything. We just should mutate the state so that the component can grab that part of the state. And actually that those products are not gonna be longer uh, internal state. They're gonna be global state. So we can get rid of this. And in our computed, we're gonna use another utility. If we have map actions to get the actions. Well, we also have map state to get the state. So we're gonna import that. And inside our, our computer properties, we can use it similarly. And well, uh, the, the name of, of, the, of the property of the state is products. Well, we wanna call it products, but also it's called products in the state, right? But this similar to actions, we can call it whatever we want. And if all of these work, I'm gonna wait a little bit more for you to, to, to get this. But if all of that work, we should not see any change, right? We just move the fetch functionality to the store, and also the state to the store, and we don't have it. We don't no longer have it in data. Oh, and the cool thing is that th since this is called the same products in our template, we didn't change. We didn't need to change anything, and also here in in our computer property, we we can just call it the same. So let's get back to our products page. There we have it. And we can see we have our products here. And if, if we inspect the component, we can see that we no longer have uh, data with, with the products, but we have these Vuex bindings. It's telling us that products come from Vuex and is basically the same data, right? Cool, so now it's exercise time again. We, we just did this for the products page, but now you're gonna do it for the single product page. Basically add the, the actions and, and state to fill this product. Um, for now, you can do it with the first product that is in the store because this is just a single product. We don't need a B4 here. And after that, or I mean, if, if you have time, we, we can, uh, as an extra challenge, you can set the product from the ID of the router. But if you just get the, the first product with, uh, with map state and map actions, uh, that should be fine. And we, we're gonna see how to do the rest. So you have 10 more minutes for this. At, 5.51, I'll check back uh, to see if you could uh, set the single product page with, with the state. Okay, and I'm just gonna start uh, doing the same with this for a single product, just in silence, in case you're you're following along. Oh, see. Yeah, right. Also, if you're way behind, uh, don't worry. We are gonna be uh, up before the, the next chapter. We we you can just get, check out to to a branch, 
and, and follow us along. So you can see if you type git branch, you can see we have all of these branches. I totally forgot about this, but we started in router. Uh, you can, well, when we fetch data, we started here. When we uh, were working with, uh, with Vuex, it started here. And after finishing this Vuex part, we're gonna move to the form validation part. All right. So how are you doing? We have three more minutes, well, four. 
Is anyone done? Remember, just render the first component. If you have time, uh, just uh, uh, also take the, well, try to take the one from the router. Yes, I can show index.js in the store. All right. So, oh, nice. <laughs> Victor already kind of got uh, how to to get that. Well, that's that that works um, using this product. And then uh, just the the ID of the params, because the ID is the same as the index of of the array, right? But if we were using uh, strings or something as an ID, that that wouldn't work. But yeah, that's a way to do it. In, in this case. And actually, I'm just going to show you uh, real quick what, what I've done to see if you do, if you did something similar. Uh, we'll basically just imported uh, the, the map actions and the map state. Uh, also, oh, sorry, it's in the single product. <laughs> yeah, well, the same, imported the map, map actions, map state. For data, I just made another loading data to uh, set it to false after it finishes the promising the promise of fetching products, and also mapped the actions to use it use the fetch products here, map the state to use the products, and my product is just the first one, uh, so I got it got it like this, and then in in the template, we just put a, a b if loading. Oh, by the way, if you want, you can also link this. Um, to to the products page like this. Um, set this to loading just to show the the loading animation and set the product data right. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So now uh, a way to to do the 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 product well the single product by uh, by URL is first convert uh, these products array into a dictionary. And I'm, I'm just gonna copy paste this uh, because we're running a little bit short on time. Uh, but yeah, we, we can call this uh, um, the products dictionary. Oh, sorry. And 
basically we're, we're, we're just going to be transforming uh, the products data like this. I'm going to paste it in the chat so that you can also uh, use it. Uh, but basically we're just iterating over each product and just setting it up with their ID as, an, as a key in, in, in the object, right? So now we can use uh, what, what some of you mentioned here, which is this route. This is the way we, we uh, get reference to, to the route object in, in, in the view instance and the params then id right so we're going to see how this works i clicked a toner which is the id tree and if we get to this single product uh, component with the view dev tools you can see that uh, sorry the okay my product dictionary is here so you can see i have one two three four just like this and for some reason he's getting me the fourth one. I'm gonna check why, right? but anyways, uh, it's taking route params ID, which is three. And yeah, I'm not sure where he's getting, giving me the fourth one instead of the third one. <laughs> Probably that's because this is uh, a string or anyone knows why. Or let me just check if it was just some kind of error. Oh yeah, it was some kind of error. <laughs> For some reason it didn't refresh correctly and it gave me the, the wrong uh, product, but yeah. Oh wait, oh. <laughs> okay, product one is giving me the black toner. For some reason, this, this is uh, why we, we need the DevTools, right? To see why, why this is happening. So the ID is two which is this one, ID two should be this one, but the route has the param ID one. But you can see this is a string, this is not a number. So I believe that's the problem for some reason, right? Oh, wait, no, I, I just realized I'm not using the products dictionary. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Yeah, now we're getting the right one. <laughs> There we go. Cool. So this is the the Vuex part. Uh, we're gonna need to fast forward to a branch because there uh, uh, we, we need to go to the form validation. There's a lot of things uh, that you, you're gonna be seeing that we change uh, in in the store after this. But uh, basically, if you want to follow along, well, first let's recap. Uh, um, when the state needs to be shared, we use Vuex, basically, when we share, need to share them between views. Uh, try to keep the store simple. Also, I, I didn't mention this, but as you saw, I didn't get the loading into the state because that will be like a global loading and we don't want that. We just use the loading whenever a, a component uses it, right? And keep it local. Um, just the, the things that you need to share, uh, put those in, in the store. Uh, use map options, map, map state. We didn't get to see map getters, but it's really, really similar. Getters are like computed properties, but for the store. And uh, well, actions should not return anything. And actions can be promises and also can call other actions. Now to jump to the form validation, if you want to keep your changes, uh, probably you can git stash or something. Uh, but if not, you can just git reset Hard, like I'm doing here. Let me just put this bigger. That will remove all of your changes, but uh, anyways, you, we don't need it because we will go to the uh, form validation one. Sorry, that that GCO is git checkout. <laughs> I have some abbreviations, but git checkout form validation. That's what you, you need to do, right? So if you're here, well, I'm gonna give you some seconds to, to change the branch. Okay, if, yeah, thank you, Jonathan, that's that's the command. So now we uh, we can see what happened here because a, a, a lot of things are the same, but for products, we can now add the card. 
uh, we we and in the store we have more actions basically to to create uh, uh, that that link between the 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 cart and the checkout button and and this other cart. If you see, I'm gonna add three yellow toners. We had ten, so now we have thirteen, and here we are. We have our yellow toners. You can check the code for this uh, later. But well, now now we are here. We want to check out, and well, the form is asking me. Luckily, it's not asking me right now for uh, credit cards. We we don't have time to do a full uh, store, but we're gonna check at least that the users put in their email and their phone so that we can call them and and tell them how to pay us, right? So uh, the thing right now is we click buy and it just refreshes the page and we're not getting any data, right? So let, let's check how that, that component looks like. And if we go to, to this checkout component, you'll see we already have these uh, form inputs. These are custom components I made, uh, which basically just have an input. Uh, and whenever you change something, they will emit this input uh, event and they receive a lot of parameters that will render uh, even if they have an error, for example. So this is a, a pretty useful component whenever you're, you, you're uh, using forms to have just one component for the whole thing like validation showing errors and well, basically uh, don't mess with that, uh, with that on, on your page, but in the component instead, right? Uh, so yeah, we need to fill this in with, with our own data. So let's do that first. We're gonna create a data object, well, data method with that returns. We need to start the email. At the beginning will be empty and the phone, which will also be empty, right? And we check that here. I'm sorry, I need to refresh so that the UTEP tools. Okay. We have it then here. They're empty. That's cool, but we need to for them to update when we change something, right? And have you used uh, B model before? Like this B model? Oops, sorry, this should be in it. So yeah, you can answer in the chat. Have you used this before? Okay, yeah, there are some people using it, that's cool. Uh, well, you, you, you will pr probably notice that, well, probably you have used these B models with inputs directly, right? And you, we're using a custom component here. So why does this work? Basically because our component is emitting an input with the, the value and also is receiving the value and that value is uh, rendered, uh, where is it? Oh, I forgot, but well, this should be value equals value. Yeah, so we have two way data binding whenever something uh, changes this value, it will update it here. And also when this changes, this will emit an input. And this is basically the manual way to do a, a V model. So if you want any of your components to have some functionality similar to V model, you can do it like that. Just a, a quick tip. And yeah, if, if, if we check this here, we can start writing, we check our checkout page and we can see that it is updating, right? All right, so now we need to validate this. Uh, the good thing is that uh, I already put some validators here. You just need to uh, remove the comments, but we already have an email validator. We can check it if you want there in the validation validators folder. It's a complex regex basically based from Stack Overflow <laughs> that I know it works, so don't worry trying to understand it. And it will just return uh, a string telling you the error or it will be empty if there are no errors, right? The same for the phone validator. Uh, if it is empty, it will say that it is required. If it's, it has something that is not numbers, it will 
tell you this. And if it's uh, more or less than 10 numbers, it will tell you this. If everything passes, then it will return just an empty string, right? So where will, will you think we should do the validation? This is like an open question. I, I, I'll wait for you to answer on the chat. Where do you think we should be uh, validating this? Or where would you do it? On blur, okay. A watcher, uh, I'm not a fan of watchers, but yeah, that's probably another option. Yeah, it's not a bad option. Actually, if you if you have used watchers, um, yeah, that's that's a, a good on submit. That's another one. What about if we do it on submit? I mean, if we just do it in a watcher, uh, whenever we type, we will get the errors, right? And if we do it on submit, um, that's cool because we we see the errors when we submit and not when we are typing, but after submitting, it will still show the error and we need to submit again to know if the error uh, works. I mean, we got, got rid of the error. So we will do a, a combination of uh, on submit and the watcher, but instead of a watcher, we're gonna use computed properties. Probably you'll notice that um, I'm a fan of computed properties because they're super cool. And uh, I will say that 90% of the times you, you'll be better using computed properties than a watcher. And you'll, you'll see uh, the way this can get solved with the computed. Uh, okay, so first let's do a computed property. Oops. Well, two, two properties in, in computed that uh, will tell us uh, if the phone has, has errors. Sorry, phone. This will store the phone error. <clears throat> And this other one will store the email error. And we're just gonna be returning the phone validator uh, executing with the phone. And the same for the email. And th this could be in, in a watcher. And yeah, probably you can just watch for the phone and check the, the uh, well, if it has errors or, or not, and probably set another data. But the cool thing is that if you do it this way, basically whenever you change the phone or, or other thing, you, you also change these phone errors. But if you need to know if the whole uh, form is valid, uh, uh, you you will also need to to do that in either of these two, right? But with computer properties, we, we can just say form is valid. And the form will be valid if these uh, phone errors is empty. And also the email error is empty. Right, and this is why I prefer computed properties over uh, the watcher because you just need to to basically check over these other computed properties and you automatically get if the form is valid. And well, uh, when when we when we submit, I mean, sorry, now that we have this, we can bind these errors to the ones that we have on our inputs, right? So we have this error field. This is the phone, so we put the phone error here and the email error here. And here's the problem, right? Like it is already validating. Well, that's cool, but we don't really want to validate until we submit, right? So I'm, I'm gonna uh, do this a little bit quick because we are running out of time and we I want to give some space for, for the testing part. So um, hopefully you catch up. Uh, if not, I'm, you, you can review the video. <laughs> so for 
uh, getting when, when the form is submitted, we just have to listen to a submit event and use this prevent. Prevent is useful whenever you uh, want to avoid the refreshing of the page. And instead of inside the function, you doing a, an event dot default dot prevent default, like we did on jQuery or other frameworks, we can just do it with this shorthand in view. So we're gonna call a submit method that we haven't created, but we're gonna create it here. Submit. And we, we want to, uh, to validate things only when it has already been submitted, right? So we, we're gonna create a should validate flag at the beginning it will be false but here we will set it to true and oh i already have methods right <laughs> okay and when this is true, then, I mean, when this is false, if we should not validate, so if we don't need to validate, we just return the empty, like if there were no errors. We do the same for the email. And well, here, in oh i already have the submit order okay uh never mind i am not gonna use this one <laughs> but i'm gonna copy the comments from this so like in the comments says if the form is valid uh we check it with this dot form is valid then we should send the order right and we're gonna see the console log only when it, it is valid. Let's see if that worked. So I'm writing, no errors, no errors, that's cool. Click by, I get errors and I didn't get the, the console log. So I'm gonna put a fake email here and fake number. I'm gonna click by and we get the order console log. All right, so well, that's for form validation. Uh, any questions so far? Because you were pretty quiet the whole part. Uh, well, for recap, you can make your own custom B model when needed to simplify things. Also use add submit that prevent to avoid refreshing the page. Uh, you can validate in real time with computed props and also uh you can oh I, I didn't check this uh but yeah we can do that super quick um i'm gonna just send you to the home page so if we we use router polish this dot router dot push and the home page whenever we submit the form well, actually, we, it should take us to the tanks form. Let me check if we have the the route. Oh yeah, we have it. Cool. So I'm just gonna send it to to the tanks page, and we can get back. We can fill this. And there we have the thank you page. So you can programmatically also navigate with the router, right? Cool. Well, now the last part, and not because it's the least important, but tests should be important always. I actually, uh, it's a good practice also to create first test and then make them pass. But in this case, we're gonna do the opposite. So you, you can follow along if you also uh, check out in, in the in the branch for testing, which is called tests, git checkout tests. But I believe our checkout table is already 
there. Yeah, we have the checkout table. So let, let's see what's, what, what we're gonna test. See, we have uh, this table and you just saw that we have the items, the quantity and the price, right? And then we have a grand total uh, where we show the, the total of the, uh, of the, all the items multiplied by, by the, their price, right? So we want to test that that total is correct. So we're gonna go to, uh, to, to the test folders. We already have this checkout table.spec.js. This is the way that uh, Jest identifies that this is a test. If it ends with .spec or .test.js, it will run the, the test. So, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna show you real quick how, uh, what's this file and what we have. So we have uh, view test details. We're importing the shallow mount function. This function helps us to mount uh, the component without its shells. Like we, if we just want to test that component, you can use shallow mount and it will do the test super quick. Um, we're importing the, the table that we want to test. And here we, we have some dummy data uh, similar to, to the products we, we store uh, in the cart so that we can test the, the component. Uh, so now this is just when uh, this function described is is just uh, we, we with it we can specify like what are we doing here so we're describing that we are testing the checkout table and then we we put an anonymous function to do the tests we can nest this describes this is not a, a just class and i'm not a yes expert but uh, if you, you can probably check out uh, just documentation so that you can see how this works. Um, on the it, we, we will put our tests. So I, I put already this uh, two it's because we want to check that the checkout table, it renders the grand total correctly. And also it emits uh, the remove item from cart uh, event when the delete button is clicked. So, First, to, to check if the grand total is correct, we're gonna uh, we're, we're gonna do a wrapper where we're gonna store our component when it is mounted. So we will we're gonna call shallow mount. Then the component we want to mount, and then in an object we will put the properties. And this is called props uh, data, I think. Not that this is gonna uh, error, but well, we're gonna put the items in, in the car by ID inside this props data. Basically this props data is whatever is gonna be sent to the component. If we check this item by, by uh, item in cart by ID, and we look at the, sorry, the checkout table, which is the one we're testing. Let me close the rest. We have these items in cart by by ID, right? So we're just sending that over with these items. Let's check our data. We have uh, one item here with well four first items, and each one costs a hundred. And this second item we have one, it costs fifty. So if I did my math correctly, this should be four hundred fifty uh, dollars, right? So the way we test that is that we expect something to be something, right? So for for starters, I'm gonna just put expect two to be true, just to see if everything is working correctly. And we can run this uh, with npm run unit, sorry, test colon unit. And you can see it's running the checkout table test and it passed. Well, the, the, it passed, the, the two passed. The first one because I just expect true to be true and the second one because I didn't expect anything, right? <laughs> so let's start doing something. Uh, let, we, let's check first where our total is. So our total is in this table and 
a good practice is to add an identifier like data test for uh, getting this data from the test. Um, I, I, I don't like using classes or IDs because if the class changes because of CSS changes, the test will break, right? So we use this data test grand total and we can look for it in the test like this. We just say wrapper dot find and put in square brackets data grand test total data test grand total sorry so this will find that um, that uh, that html node so we could call call this total node and basically we will expect that total node dot text to be 450 oh it's it's text so i'm going to put it as a string um, this is a method like that every wrapper or uh, every HTML node has inside view test to kit, so you can call it like this. And now we we'll run the test again. You'll see that something failed. But the cool thing is that we're almost there. It is printing also the dollar sign and the two zeros. So we just need to add that to the test and it should be fine, right? Okay, so we do that. And by the way, you can run this with double dash, then double dash again and watch. And it will keep running. And whenever you do a change, it will tell you, it, it will uh, run the test again. So you can see it passed, that's cool. I can remove a zero, save. You, you saw that the test run again and it should crash. Well, not crash, but uh, show that it, it has an error. There you go. Cool. Well, let's do the same thing for buttons super quick because we're almost on time. So we just mount the, the checkout table and now we, expect, we are gonna take the wrapper and we're gonna look for the button. Remember the delete button? Luckily, I already added that um, data test delete button here. We can search for it with the find, and we can call this delete button. And we're gonna trigger a click. So you do, do that this way. And the thing that we're gonna expect here is not a change in the value because this just will, uh, th th this will, oh, sorry, this is the lead button. This should just emit a, an event. So we expect the wrapper it. This is a function that will give you all of the emitted events Sorry, it's double T, one M. Then remove item from cart, which is the name of the event. And we're gonna check the length because it should have be uh, called one time, right? So if we do that, this should pass. Oh, it imported something for some reason. And I'll, I'll get to the components. So you can see I'm listening for the click. I call this remove item from cart. And it will just uh, emit this remove item from cart. And you can see it passed. It was called one time. If I try to say like, hey, did you call it two times? It will say no. There you go. So it says like, hey, I, I was expecting to, but no, it was just called once. So that's fine. Cool. All right. So super quick recap on view tests, view tools. Um, you, well, I didn't show you this, but you should decouple your components for easier testing. Uh, remember we had the some components with the direct, directly calling actions and, and state. 
uh, I was doing the same for this checkout table, but uh, the problem is that I will need to mock the state to make this work, which could be a little bit harder. So what I did is that I just did a checkout table provider that will get everything from the store using map actions and, and getters and just call the same component with the data. So that way we can just easily uh, test the, the component without having to mock all of the store. Um, also, shallow mount will not mount nested components. You can use it for faster tests. Uh, you can find nodes in your components with data test selectors like we did. And like I mentioned about using classes and IDs because they can break your test if someone changes it for other reasons like styles or something. And tests are more valuable if, if the, you just check functionality. If you saw I didn't check like, oh, this should have like this CSS class or this should be inside a, a, a div, inside a, a paragraph that has this class, right? That's that's not really scalable when you test things. All right, so before uh, passing to the Q&A section, I just want to show you uh, this feedback survey. Oh, let, let me just copy the, the link so that you can visit it. Uh, but it will make us super happy if you can give us any feedback uh, for improving this course. And, and also uh, in this uh, survey, you'll find that we, uh, you, you can also answer for other courses that you're interested in. So I'm just gonna uh, leave that for some seconds and, but we can start with Q&A. Um, if you have any questions um, related or, or not to what we saw, but related to view, just shoot. Yeah, the video is gonna be shared. Uh, actually, if you go to, to YouTube and look for WiseLine Academy, uh, you'll find that we already have a bunch of videos on, on many courses. So yeah, this will be uploaded eventually. And I think that also they will send you a reminder in, in the email for you to check. Oh yeah, any book or uh, to learn about uh, Vue. Uh, oh, I, I I actually put these resources where most of the good practices are because this is the official documentation of everything we saw, like the router, the, um, the view test tutorials, UX, and also uh, the cookbook is super good because they show you also real uh, world cases and how they will solve it. So that's another good one. And view documentation is awesome. You, you'll see that you don't probably need a book if you just read their documentation. Okay, uh, this uh, uh, question that is really hard to answer, like which is better, Vue, Angular, or React? I think it depends on your case. Uh, everyone, any of those frameworks has their pros and cons. Uh, for example, uh, well, React is the biggest one. Uh, it's backed by Facebook and basically uh, has a, a, a pretty big community. So everything has already been done for React, right? And basically if you if you don't, you have a problem doing something, uh, most probably someone already solved it. So that's the advantage of React. But the disadvantage is that it's hard to, to learn and they're changing things a lot. Like they just introduced hooks some months ago and people are, people are just getting to them and they are learning to do uh, the class well, on learning to do the class uh, components or, well, having difficult time uh, doing components one way or another. Uh, Angular, it forces to have you TypeScript, I mean, to use TypeScript. So that's cool if you're doing an enterprise app. Actually, I, uh, in my project, I use Vue with TypeScript, but I think Angular 3 or 2, I don't remember which version, it, uh, forces it. So. Uh, that's a pro of Angular if you want to see it that, that way, but also it's a con uh, because you, uh, if your team doesn't know TypeScript, that will be hard. And Vue has a smaller community than React, probably bigger than Angular. Um, but the advantage is that it's the most 
uh, easy of the three to, to learn. In my case, uh, in my team, uh, I choose a view because we were using, well, my, my team had a lot of experience using PHP and the system we were doing was gonna be a mix of PHP and, and well, front end with uh, JavaScript. So Vue was easier for them to learn because they were already experts in, the, in PHP, but not in JavaScript. And um, if I had chose uh, React, for example. So that's why I mentioned it depends on your personal case on your team. Uh, oh, okay, well, I, I think uh, I just skipped the, the question, how do you handle errors on the store actions? That's a really good question. Probably I, I will say that since you don't return anything, you just reject the promise. Remember, you it's a good practice to re, uh, to make that promise. Then you just reject the promise with an error and that component that is using the action can handle the error. If you need to change the, I mean, to share the error, I will say probably handle the error. Like if, if, if you were waiting for products to, to be filled in the array and the array is empty and the promise already uh, finished, then you will put an error like, oh, and no products found, right? Because the promise finished, but the the mutation, I mean, there was no mutation. It didn't change uh, the object, I mean, the, the array, right? So you can put an, an error on every component depending on, on what change of state you, you were waiting. I wh What I wouldn't suggest is to add a, an error state in your store. Um, uh, and I don't suggest the error thing because you might have like error for um, for something, error for other thing, and that be can become a mess. Okay, so the islands you have are just a personal preference or have any impact in view like performance, avoid errors. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's a good question. And let me get back to uh, to this part where we have the configuration for just linked. Uh, the essential ones, Actually, this plugin, Vue Essential, has like many rules. There, uh, you, you can look for ESLint view. And the essential ones are essential because they do affect uh, performance. So I, I, I will say, or they have other problems that if, if, you, uh, if you don't use, you, you, you make a, a, an error in with those essential rules. Uh, you will have problems. So, oh yeah, here are the rules. There are some base rules that you cannot disable, then you have the essential ones. And actually, uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, these are for error prevention. So yeah, most basically all, all of these are to prevent errors and also performance issues. Then there's the strongly recommended, which these are just like uh, styles Per, like personal preferences, like if you want HTML self-closing tags and, or stuff like that, you, you can enforce those things. And the priority C is recommended and it's just minimizing arbitrary choices for your team to not discuss like, hey, we should not use, uh, we, we should have the, or, for the, for example, ordering components is like, you should put first data, then uh, computed, then methods, or there, there's an order or, or, or of those things, right? So. I will say uh, use the essentials and the other ones, if you like them, use them too, or you can basically activate or deactivate the ones that you don't want. Cool, so I think those are all the questions, I believe. Uh, well, thank you everyone. And uh, I would like for you to virtually clap for the mentors then that were helping me uh, answering all of the questions to uh, they're doing a, a great job and and their volunteers so uh, I'm, I'm pretty grateful that they were helping me uh, on this part of the course and oh okay another question what topics will you put in a VGS advanced level course okay uh, probably I will put some extra tools like Nux JS um, but that, that will be a course on itself, right? Nox.js is a framework um, that basically ser uh, makes server-side rendering with Vue. 
everything we, we did in, in our site is client side server, right? So if you turn up JavaScript, it won't work. But if you use Nox.js, there's a lot of things that this framework does already out of the box and help you to server side render, to um, handle big sites. Actually, the, the site I, I mentioned that has like uh, 2 billion, or I don't remember how many billion uh, requests per month uh, uses Nox.js. And well, other topics, I'm not sure, probably go deeper into Vuex or uh, other, well, like for example, we didn't see animations. There's uh, special components for animations in Vue. There's like a lot of things that could go in, in an advanced course. All right, well, we're, uh, we're on time, so thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, as I mentioned, the video will be on YouTube so that, that you can uh, rework all of this. And well, thank you everyone for, for joining this afternoon. Have a good time. See ya.